This is Women Road Warriors with Shelley Johnson and Kathy Takaro. From the corporate office to the cab of a truck, they're here to inspire and empower women in all professions. So gear down, sit back, and enjoy. Welcome to Women Road Warriors with Shelley Johnson and Kathy DeCaro. We're a show that works to inspire and empower women in every profession and lifestyle. Whether you're at home, in the office, or in the cab of a truck, we help power you on the road to success. We tackle all kinds of topics and work to encourage women to be their very best with informative guests and women who've been champions. I'm Shelley. And I'm Kathy. No topic is taboo on our rig. We tackle the tough topics along with the not-so-tough topics. And we like to feature experts and celebrities who can assist women in being the very best they can be. We especially love to feature women who've been trailblazers, as well as celebrities. Many of our guests have had multiple careers. Women often make many career choices and like to hear about women who've been innovators and trailblazers as they explore their own route to success. Jamie Beebe is no exception to this rule. She's been a successful casting director in film, television, and new media. She's also the producer and co-host of a popular true crime podcast called Strictly Stalking, where she interviews survivors of stalkers. If that's not enough, she's also a successful entrepreneur and the owner of the Boyfriend Bikini Company. We wanted to learn more about Jamie's intriguing background, so we invited her on the show today. Welcome, Jamie. Thank you for being with us. Thanks so much for having me. So how did all of this get started? You've gone in a lot of different directions. <laughs> I have. You know, I've always gone in a lot of different directions. I was one of those kids that just didn't know what they wanted to do when they grew up. Um, and so that kind of meant I wanted to try everything. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, when I left school, when I left high school, I actually followed, I wanted to follow the dead. Um, but that was the year that Jerry Garcia actually died. So I couldn't follow the dead. I followed uh, a band called Fish for a while and kind of traveled around the U.S. Um, and my parents hated that. So <laughs> I kind of ran out of money in Ohio, um, in a college town in Athens, Ohio. And my dad was like, OK, well, you can go to college now. So that's how I decided to go to college. Um, and I got my bachelor's degree in photography I figured that would be easy and fun and creative. Um, but then, you know, as soon as I graduated was actually when digital came out, like digital yeah. photos. And I was like, oh, that'll never last. Like, that's not a thing. Um, but it was a thing and it did last. And so my degree was kind of more obsolete because we were really learning more film, like how to develop film, how to, you know, just do everything with film. We didn't really learn much about the actual, you know, anything about digital or, you know, such a changing time. Um, so then I left Ohio and moved to Chicago, um, met a guy, which is a recurring theme in my life story. Um, <laughs> met a guy, a great guy though. And he um, wanted to be a rock star. So I went, I ended up going back to school and getting a master's degree in music management because I really believed that he was going to be a rock star. And so I figured if he's going to be a rock star, he's, you know, not going to leave me behind. So I'll manage his band. Um, cool. Yeah. So he didn't turn out to be a rock star, but we did move out to Los <laughs> Angeles together. Um, and, uh, you know, we broke up after we moved out to Los Angeles. He's actually a chiropractor now and married and has a kid and we're still great friends, but um, that's, that's quite a juxtaposition there. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's hard to be a rock star. Mm -hmm. um, and so at that point, you know, I was out in Los Angeles and I was like, okay, well, I'll just manage bands. Um, and that was definitely not what I wanted to do. It was like babysitting grown men that were like, not even as, you know, kind as children most of the time. <laughs> not as polite and well-mannered as children. Um, so that was just something I didn't want to do. And then I just kind of, you know, I tried real estate. I, you know, I, at one point, I think I wanted to be a magician and I took classes to be a magician. I tried really everything. Um, and then I met another guy <laughs> and he was going to, he wanted to be a director and start a company 
um, like direct a production company. And he's like, oh, well, you can just manage the company. And I was like, oh, of course. I had never been on a set. I knew nothing at all about any of that. Um, but, you know, Google is my friend. So I, I kind of learned it pretty quickly and read everything I could and hired some of the better people that I could and learn from them. Um, and we had a fairly successful company for a minute. And then um, when we broke up, uh, I decided to become a casting director because it was like kind of the easiest part. <laughs> Not really the easiest, just everyone's super nice to the casting director. You know, like oh, if yeah. I call, people are going to answer because I'm going to offer a job, you know? Oh, sure. Yeah. It's like the happiest job I could think of. So um, I thought that would be, you know, and I figured people would hire me. I'd already kind of been doing it for this one company, but it's really kind of hard to get into the industry. So I started out casting reality shows, which is much easier to get into. And then um, I knew I didn't, I was making decent money casting reality shows, but didn't feel comfortable with a lot of the content that I was putting out there. <laughs> um, just because, you know, it's really exploitive and it, it's not a good thing for a lot of people um, to be on those shows. And so I knew I wanted to do scripted like TV and film, but I didn't want to start at the bottom and, you know, intern for five years and do all that or whatever. And so I started going to the universities and the schools and asking the students if they needed a casting director. And most of them did. And they would hire me for like pennies, you know, <laughs> like pretty much nothing. But how that worked then is, you know, they started graduating and getting bigger and better jobs and they kind of brought me along with them. So I started growing and eventually I was able to leave um, reality casting. I still do some once in a while if it's like, a decent a morally decent show um but then I got into scripted you know tv and film and did that for a long time until COVID pretty much and then um right before COVID I wanted to do a podcast because I listen to podcasts all the time I love podcasts especially true crime I've always been into true crime and um I called my business partner and I was like, well, he wasn't really my business partner back then. He was more of a friend, but <laughs> I was like, I really want to do a true crime podcast, but all the good murders are taken. Everyone's already doing them. Um, and he was like, well, why don't you, why don't we, you know, let's do something about stalking. Like no one's doing anything about that. And I, very, very true. Dramatic. Yeah. yeah. And I'm, I'm very dramatic. So I, I was like, I'm not doing that. I don't know anything about that. And I hung up on him. Um, but then as what always happens is, you know, then I start thinking about it. I'm like, wait, there's a whole crime out there that I don't know anything about. And, you know, if I don't know about it, a lot of people probably don't know about it. Uh, and I started doing a bunch of research and realized, like, just how horrific stalking is and, and mm -hmm. you know, the trauma involved in it. And, you know, it was insane what I was learning. And within, you know, a week we were in... Um, the office of a, a media company and pitching it. And I was like, Hey, you know, cause I don't know anything about doing a podcast, you know? Um, but Hey, let's put this out. And they agreed. And so that's how we started the podcast. And it really became something more than what we thought it would. Um, once we kind of, once we talked to people and started learning what it was about and, you know, that the laws just aren't caught up to anything and, you know, people aren't getting justice and, people are getting hurt and killed and, you know, nothing's being done. So we really became advocates in the field um, kind of by accident, you know? And then uh, after that, uh, right after the podcast came out, I actually left my, the boyfriend I had for a while. Um, we were together for a long time. It was a really bad relationship. It was very abusive, unfortunately, but um, I did leave um, February 14th of 2020 Valentine's Day and um so the next couple of years you know it was COVID and I was staying home and just really starting to work on myself and you know get my confidence back and um learn and just remember who I was you know from that relationship and I was working on the podcast a bunch and also during that time I think part of my healing process was going out and doing all the things that you know he had told me I couldn't do because you know I was dumb or whatever, all the names that he called. Um, and so I started traveling. I've been to, oh, I don't know, 20 
to 25 countries in the last wow. three years by myself. Wow, so, so good that's for you. amazing. Yeah. yeah. And so I started doing that and realized um, on my travels, because I do prefer warm places. Who um, doesn't? Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, I'm on the beach a lot and I would always buy bikinis wherever I was. And I love bikinis. It's just like a thing. When, when I was little, my mom had this big drawer full of bikinis and I would always go look at them. They were shiny and I don't know. <laughs> I was a weird kid. Um, but I'd always kind of wanted a bikini company. So I kept buying these bikinis like in different countries and stuff. And they were all great, but like, I was always searching for like the perfect one, the perfect fit, the perfect everything. Um, and I was like, you know, I'm just going to see if I can just make one, you know, for myself. So, and then it became kind of, you know, I, I hired a, a woman to help me make the pattern out of France. And then I was looking for a manufacturer, you know, I started really making it a big thing. And then I was like, well, I'm just going to do the whole company at this point because I've already gone this far. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So I went out to Bali and um, I met with a manufacturer that I really liked because, um, you know, it's a more ethical pr production, com or production company, um, ethical producing, you know, manufacturer. Um, they let people work from home. You know, we give them a sewing machine. They have a deadline. They don't have to, you know, work in a factory. So they're able to spend time with their families and their children. You know, they're paid appropriately. Um, so I went out there and saw everything and ordered my first run and um, picked them up from Bali and came back and launched my company on February 14th of this year. So three years later, after my little Good free. For you. Day, yeah. Yeah. And, um, and I decided to name it the boyfriend bikini because, um, well, I was still, you know, I had, I still do have some anger, but I was really angry about the whole relationship and, you know, why I put up with it for so long, how hard it was to leave all the things he did. You know, you have a lot of feelings when you get out of a relationship like oh, that. Oh boy. Yep. Yep. Then they've done that. <laughs> oh yeah. So I had a lot of anger and, and I didn't know what to call the company. And I was like, well, I'm going to call it the ex-boyfriend and ha ha on him he said I could never do this and I'm gonna make money and whatever and and my girlfriend was like why would you name something that you want so bad after something that you hated so much like you're really putting this negative spin on it and I was like well you're right like that's not what I want to do so I decided to turn it around and call it the boyfriend bikini and then each um style and and color is named after um, more of a, a positive type of guy um, that I've had in my life. You know, like I named one after my dad and my brother. And I mean, they have like cute little names, like daddy issues, you know, that's so cute. And then um, each one, when you order it, it comes with a story about like that type of person. Um, and it's kind of a personal story, um, but it comes with a story about, you know, the bikini that you got, like, you know, my dad's really awesome and I love him and he's always been really supportive and, um you know, kind of like that, or, you know, my little brother, he's cute and, you know, he's great. That's really sweet. Um, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then part of the proceeds goes to the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence. So oh, I really cool. wanted to put that positive spin on it. Mm -hmm. So it's for a great cause. I think so. Yes. And then Good for you for you know, paying it forward. This is excellent. Yeah. Well, then, you know, eventually down the line, hopefully if I can, what I'd like to do, um, you know, once the bikini company grows a little bit more is be able to kind of like franchise it out to women that are coming out of shelters. So, um, you know, they're able to like, I, I would still, you know, get the, they wouldn't have to put any money out, um, you know, to start up like their own little portion of the bikini, the wave of bikini. So um, they would sell them. I'd still, you know, mail them out or whatever, and they'd get a percentage and, or, you know, work with it one way or another just because it's so hard for women when they leave the shelter they have mm -hmm. nothing you know and who knows you know they may have they may not have worked before when they were with their abuser or they might have kids or they might not know where they can live or no one wants to hire them because they haven't worked or you know there's so many reasons and it's so hard to come out of a shelter like that so sure. my hope is ultimately to to help somehow in there it you know, is that's hard like I, I personally was in and out of shelters for a few years while I was nursing. Oh, um, you know. oh yeah. <laughs> it's just, it was just, it was brutal, brutal. And watching the, the other women in there and their stories and how difficult it is. You only have so much time to be in there and they're, they're, yep. 
they're you know you'd think they'd be more loving and understanding but man are they unforgiving in just you got this 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 uh you know for timelines and they don't and if you don't meet that you know two or three weeks some some places is only a week that you can stay you know because there's a waiting list and they throw you out well where are you gonna go you got all these kids you have all these mental health issues and you're you're overwhelmed by life and, and that's it, why so many women go back to their abusers yeah they yeah. have nowhere else to go right yeah. you have to feed your kids you have to feed yeah. yourself i mean you can't sleep outside you know i mean it's, it's horrible true. yeah, yeah. It's, and the stress the stress oh god Money awesome. is one of the biggest reasons I think women stay um, oh, because yeah. they have to provide. And Well, money and just like the mental, it's so confusing when you're with yeah. someone like that and mm -hmm. you don't, I mean, I don't even think I, I definitely knew it was wrong while I was in it, but I don't think I understood. I was like, well, it's not, it's not me. Like, it's not happening to me, even though it was every day, you know? Mm -hmm. It was just, yeah. I think women just get confused a little bit by it and, and all the mental um, and emotional abuse too, on top of that, you know? Yeah. That's, that's a lot of it. They play mind games with you. You oh, start yeah. questioning yourself. Oh, you start believing what they're saying. Oh, I yeah, was my... so confused. I would videotape, I would hit record, which is one of the best things I probably could have done. I hit record on my phone so many times because he would be like, no, I, I didn't do that. Like five seconds after he did something, you know, he'd like smack me or whatever no I didn't I'm like but you did like just now no I didn't and I thought I was just going insane sure and he was telling me I was going insane so mm. I was like oh my god am I going insane and I would I would hit record I'm like okay no he really did do that you know it, it was yeah. crazy. they're great my, at gaslighting yeah oh. my, my my first husband was like that too like you know like stupid things like tell you know before I moved in I said well what about uh you don't have these toilet paper issues, right? Like, you know, little things like, does that have to go one way or the other or whatever? Like, I don't care. And he says, no, no, I don't care. Whatever, you know, it's toilet paper. And not, not even three weeks later, a month later, oh my God, he had the biggest fit because the toilet paper was on the wrong way. I'm like, but you said, <laughs> like, I know what you said. I never said that. Kind of goes off making me feel like, well, I'm sure he said that. <laughs> like, I know yeah. he said that. Right? So, yeah. yeah. They know how to hit your hot buttons. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. It's a it's a crazy situation to to be in. It's, it's I mean, the confusion, I think, is just one of those things that it's hard to recover. It's so hard to just recover from the basic confusion of it, not to mention all the other issues that have trailed behind that, you know. Sure. There's so many elements that go into domestic violence. It's such a confusing perplexing and terrible situation to be in and it keeps people trapped much like stalking that's another area where women are often victimized and we're definitely going to be talking about that and what you're doing to create awareness stay tuned for more of women road warriors coming up industry movement trucking moves america forward is telling the story of the industry our safety champions, the women of trucking, independent contractors, the next generation of truckers, and more. Help us promote the best of our industry. Share your story and what you love about trucking. Share images of a moment you're proud of. And join us on social media. Learn more at TruckingMovesAmerica.com. Welcome back to Women Road Warriors with Shelley Johnson and Kathy Takaro. Nearly one in three women are stalked every year in the United States. One in six men experience this as well. Jamie Beebe is the producer and co-host of the popular true crime podcast, Strictly Stalking, where she interviews survivors of stalking. Jamie's experienced domestic violence herself, and she's the founder of the Boyfriend Bikini Company, which donates a portion of its proceeds to the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Jamie, you've been quite the survivor in spite of what you experienced in an abusive relationship, and you're paying it forward with what you're doing. You haven't lost sight of yourself, which is so important. So many survivors do. And I think a lot of women, when they encounter these kind of situations, they lose themselves. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think I was really, really lucky with the timing because 
it was a month before lockdown. And if I had been locked down with them, I don't know. I don't know if I'd still be here. I mean, it was, you know, it was pretty bad. And a lot of women aren't here because of that, you know, mm -hmm. because they were locked down with their abusers. Yeah. It was right before lockdown. And so because it was locked down, because it was COVID and quarantine and all that, I had like no choice other than to just be in my house by myself. You know, luckily it was my house that he moved into and out of, um, but be in my house by myself and mm -hmm. deal with myself all alone, you know, in, in one of the scariest times of, you know, a lot of people's lives. So I just felt like I didn't have a choice other than to heal. You know, I was very lucky. Yeah. In that point. Well, bravo to you to being able to do that. And it, were... it kind of blends in with the stalking, you know, with what you're, you're talking about, because a lot of the, um, I know in my personal God awful, horrible, abusive relationship, mm -hmm. um, trying to leave why one of the reasons I would have to go back is because he would stalk me and hound me and then bring me back. And, um, like it was, it was horrible. I mean, trying to, I'd come home, I'd, I'd move out, I'd find the courage to move out. And then, um, I'd find, I'd come home and he'd broken in, he'd found where I lived and he'd be li put leaving messages, writing handwritten messages on the walls. Oh, I'm yeah. coming to get you, you, you know, the C word, not like whatever, all these horrible names. And I'm looking at this wall. I'm like, oh my God, like, <laughs> right. And, and so then it'd be back and forth, back and forth. And like, I, I felt there's no escape. Like I couldn't get away. Oh, and yeah, then that, it, it, it happens it, all the time. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. And, but people don't talk about it. No. Nope. Well, and that is what we, we do actually talk a lot about that um, on Strictly Stalking on the podcast. And that's one of the reasons that I finally started coming forward more with my story, you know, with my base of relationship, because I didn't talk about it for a long time. I was terrified of him, especially, you know, being alone and COVID and I mean, right? he can come here and kill me. Right. So um, I didn't talk about it for a long time, but I was getting like triggered, you know, every time I would interview somebody for my podcast, because it's so often it's, you know, there's domestic violence and then stalking or stalking and, you know, they go hand in hand. I didn't okay. get stalked, oh, but yeah. But yeah, they go hand in hand. So I was just listening to story after story after story. And I was like, you know, it finally hit me because I would be so upset sometimes after I would do these interviews. And I couldn't, I didn't, I guess I didn't really understand why. I mean, it seems obvious now looking back. Um, but, you know, it just hit me one day. I was like, oh my God, like I'm listening to my story over and over. Mm -hmm. And I'm not speaking yeah. about it. I'm asking all these people to speak up about it and I'm not doing that. And so I think that's really when um, things also kind of turned for me where I was like, you know, I, I, I'm i not going to live my life scared of him. Um, you know, I don't name him, but it's <laughs> it's not hard yeah. to, you know, find him. But, um, you know, so I, I that's when I started speaking up. And I think that helped, you know, with the bikini company and everything else because then I just kind of went full forward sure mm -hmm. it's empowering and you were able to free yourself and you're helping other people the thing oh, is yeah. with with stalking what's interesting and it depends on where you are uh, it can vary the laws vary from state to state mm -hmm. but yep. typically women are told and it's usually women I believe that are stalked it um, is more often yeah. but there are a lot of men that are stalked they really don't come forward as much that that makes sense. Yeah. I know that typically people are told by the police, we can't do anything until they do something. And you can get this restraining order, which eh, it helps if they obey the law. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a piece of paper. Yeah. And so it doesn't really make people protect feel more you. confident. And it, yeah, it doesn't protect right. you. I mean, but it is good to get that restraining order as soon as as you can. And the reason is because then, I mean, in order to get any type of justice for stalking, you basically have to call the police every single time they do any little thing. And then you yep. have to log it. And then, you know, and you have to, it, it's not easy at all. I mean, it's, mm. it's a full time yeah. job to get any justice from a stalker, but the restraining order does put that on record. So then, you know, the next time or the next time or the next time, hopefully one of those times after the restraining order, um, you know, you can get some type of justice or some kind of, you know, legal something there. In your podcast, what have you found out, essentially, what's the common denominator among stalkers? What makes them do that? Oh, wow. Um, 
there, I mean, it's so different with each one, but mm-hmm. I do think that, I mean, it's, it's an addiction. I, I really, my personal belief um, is that it's an addiction. It's like smoking or, you know, drinking or something like that. Um, I mean, on, on a different level, of course, but a same type of like addiction where they can't stop, you know, for a lot of them. And also a lot of stalkers have, you know, mental illness or mental issue of some form. Um, you know, whether it's, I mean, there's all kinds of different types of mental illnesses, I think that come out as stalking, which is really interesting that it, it happens, you know, so much. Um, but definitely, you know, some type of mental illness and like that addiction factor is in there. Yeah. I remember. Control. Yeah. It would be yeah. a control thing too. I was thinking that. Yep. Yeah. Well, and especially like with, you know, intimate partner stalking, um, which we do get a lot of, you know, that's, that is all along the same lines of domestic violence and control and, you know, ownership. And, you know, if I, if I can't have, you no one can, and which is very, very, very dangerous. <laughs> oh yeah. And the, and those types of stalkers, you know, they also, they're your, they were or are your intimate partner. And so they know everything about you. So they can stalk you so much more terrifyingly because they know where, you know, the lines are, they know where to find you better. They know how to hurt you more, you know, so it's, it's pretty terrifying. And then you can have total strangers doing the same thing or somebody that, um, well, I remember this was years ago. There Mm -hmm. was somebody I was nice to, and it was a guy and he kind of took it the wrong way. I was not interested in dating him. Well, he was very interested in pursuing me and he ended up showing up at my workplace, uh, dropping off flowers. He ended up in a secured building at my apartment, leaving things at my apartment door. Uh, wow. I remember one morning waking up and he was on my balcony. Oh, my God. Yeah. And I'm, so I'm looking at him. I'm like, what the H are you doing here? <laughs> He's like, well, I couldn't get in the building. I just, you know, crawled up on your balcony. I said, and you can crawl back down the way you came. <laughs> you know. <laughs> It, 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 oh. it, it really does, you know, yeah. especially like with women on, you know, dating sites and, you know, all that kind of stuff or walking down the street, you catch the attention of somebody who has, you know, that mental illness or, you know, that something happens, you know, in their, in their heads where they think that they're legitimately in a relationship with you and you don't even yeah. know that. Yep. And it's not just famous people and celebrities either. It's it's yeah. anybody at any time, anywhere. Yeah, that sounds right. Because I remember him saying something like, well, I've missed you. It's like, oh, yeah. okay. How did you get rid of that guy? Well, I ended up calling security. Luckily, we had security guards in that community. And, mm-hmm. and I let them know. I said, he's mm-hmm. uh, getting off my balcony right now. I can tell you what direction he's headed. This is what he looks <laughs> like. You know. yeah. yeah. He actually lived in that community. And oh, wow. uh, so, yeah. Um, and I called management. I said, this is not acceptable. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. Yeah. But it's scary. It, it really is. is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's you don't... Just, there's yeah. no, there's no common denominator among the victims. It, it's anybody. It's anything you do. You could be a, a homebody and still get stalked. You could go out every night and still get stalked. You know, there's nothing, there's no commonality between you know, the victims, really, it, it's just anybody. And that's scary. That's why awareness is so important, which we're trying to bring to our listeners. Stay tuned for more of Women Road Warriors coming up. Trucking Moves America Forward, or TMAF, is building a positive image of trucking by telling the story of the hardworking drivers and industry professionals who support the industry. And you can be a part of it. Learn more about TMAF and how you can join and be a part of the industry movement working to build a strong image of trucking by visiting TMAF's website at truckingmovesamerica.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and our latest channel, TikTok. Welcome back to Women Road Warriors with Shelley Johnson and Kathy Takaro. What motivates stalking? It's a terrifying concept and all too common. Women are stalked the most. How do people get away from a stalker without getting hurt? 
Jamie Beebe is the co-host of the true crime podcast, Strictly Stalking. She interviews survivors of stalking. She's a domestic violence survivor herself, an entrepreneur who gives back to help the survivors of domestic violence. Jamie has some compelling insight into the untold phenomenon of stalking. So, Jamie, with the people that you've interviewed, how did they get away from their stalker? Um, you know, a lot of them haven't. Um, mm. A lot of them are still being stalked. You know, we we had a woman that was stalked for 40 years. Um, oh, my goodness. Yeah, it's it's very, very difficult to to get justice. Most stalkers will stalk until they either die, go to prison or find somebody else, um, which is also unfortunate. But even if they find somebody else, a lot of times they'll still come back. It just might take, a you know, a, it's a little longer between stalking episodes because they, you know, they'll rotate, I guess, you know, they're they're victims. Um, you know, it's. It's interesting that you say that because when my ex, because he, for years, he hounded me, right? And the fear was like this, not only the fact that he was an enforcer for a bike club, but he's just, he's just a horrible human being. But um, the, when he stopped, it took me a while to just kind of accept it. Okay. He's not, he's not there. But then I actually was thinking, you know what? He probably found somebody else to yeah, some yeah. other soft or you know vulnerable woman and he's zoned in on her and I was thinking I feel awful for her but I'm kind of thankful in a way that he's off my back because he was he was such an evil human being and yeah but but then again 10 uh, was it five years later six years later I got a call um actually this is about five years ago and I left him, you know, I, or no, I wasn't left. I, I call it the great escape <laughs> in 2007. Yeah, like day. That's how I define it. The great escape was in 2007. Um, and about five years ago, I got a call from my friend who's I used to live at. And I he that's where he, he would break into. And I got a call from him. He says, hey, you're he always called him my master. He said, your master uh, called me the other day and let to let me know that uh, to tell you that he's still he's still going to hunt you down until, oh, he, he figured I owed him something, That's, some ridiculous oh, amount of money that he would scary. hunt me down in this lifetime and the next. And oh that, my goodness. Right. Until oh. he, till I, oh, I paid him back some ridiculous, which I, which, which is stupid because um, he's the one who took my cars and all my things. And anyway. Oh yeah. And, I mean, they're, so they're I, I, delusional. Yeah. I made a decision that very day because I'm thinking, oh my God, he's going to find me again. Oh my God. Right. And I made a decision that day. I said, I am not changing my phone number because by now my book was written and he had found out that, you know, that where I work and I was, you know, self-sufficient and doing all this stuff. And he just wanted to extort money. And I said, I am not living in fear. I am not going to fall into that trap that I, I am not that same woman right, as I was back in 2007. And so what I did, I, I just installed a, a recording device on my phone because my, my coworker happened to be a police sergeant for 25 years and uh, she needed a, a career change at 55, which is awesome because I started at 42. <laughs> anyway, so I asked her some advice. She says, Kathy, even if you put a restraining order on him, she said, number one, that type of guy, you're going to piss him off even more. And yeah. uh, number two. She says, we can't do anything unless you have proof. She says, put that recording on his, on your phone so that you have, when he calls to extort you and, you know, terrify you and do all that, at least you have his own voice saying yep. that. Yeah. So I did that and I didn't change my number and I stood my ground and I'm like, Hey, I am not that person. You come after me. I'm going to, I'm going to throw your sorry ass in jail. And you know what? I think because I took charge of my own life for, for, you know, especially having lived a decade in fear from this guy. Um, and I said, I'm going to face him no matter what, and I will put his ass in jail. Well, you know what? It dissolved. He never contacted me. He was just that one last, and because I didn't fall into his game, I think. Yeah. The universe sure. granted me, uh, you know, the release of he's not, he's not hounding me anymore. So he was yeah. hoping you'd take the bait somehow. Yeah. 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 I didn't fall for it. And I'm really glad that I didn't change my number, that I didn't move across the country and, you know, mm -hmm. that I stood my ground. And I mean, it was and a gamble either way, but I feel that I won that one. I mean, you did touch upon something there, though that I talk a lot about in the podcast is that it can, I guess, in a way, make things worse once you 
go to the police or get a restraining order um, because it can, you know, make them more mad um, yeah. and then they're going to lash out. But unfortunately, I think that they would probably do that anyway. And so yeah. Yeah. you're probably speeding up the process, but it's, you know, the only way, the only way, at least in this country that you can start to get help is by going to the police and getting the re first restraining order. And the second, you know, like, you know, they violated and all that kind of stuff, which is, I mean, the laws are just not made for, for this, but I mean, it's really the only way, but it, it can make things, I guess, I don't think it makes it worse. I think it speeds up the making it worse. Yeah. 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 These people are into power. And, mm -hmm. and I agree that they have a mental issue. No doubt about that. But they they like to, I think they're almost um, obsessed with the game of cat and mouse, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good way of explaining it. Yeah. 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 And they want to keep the, the victim as a mouse. And when that mouse turns into this really large rodent that can eat them, <laughs> they go the other direction. It, it's a matter of taking back your power. And mm -hmm. it's amazing how many times women go through life and they're always having to fight for their power, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know that, that, that decision that I made to not run, to not change my number, to not move, to not live in fear, to stand my ground. It, it ultimately profoundly, I should say, changed, um, something deep inside of me, um, mm -hmm. like but more confident, like not the confidence, but just holding my ground like a warrior like a gladiator I'm like come on you know like this is it this stops here <laughs> and since that moment it it it's it's as if anything that comes my way I feel like that 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 warrior that no yep. you know that I, you're not you're not going to get me that way and I'll fight to the end and no like this, I'm done living the way I used to live oh yeah it's it's standing up against against that you know and and there's a lot of ways to do that, whether it's, you know, speaking out or even leaving as a way of standing up. You know, there's there's a lot of ways to do that for sure. I, I bet there's a lot of our listeners that can um, relate to this. Remember, Shelly, we had one uh, uh, that, that lady who is human trafficked and she was driving a truck. Uh -huh. because it gave her a way that they could never find her right yep. it was her and way she, of escaping her trafficker yep mm -hmm. she had a home on wheels and money yep yep, yep. gave her yep. the independence which right. i love mm -hmm. yeah and that's a lot of it it's so common unfortunately women are in positions where they're dependent and if they have an abuser that abuser does something to keep them dependent somehow mm -hmm. And they feel like they can't get away or they've been conditioned as children. Mm -hmm. um, and just because we're put in those positions, we don't have to stay there. And Jamie, it sounds like you've had a lot of transitions with different relationships and so forth, but mm -hmm. you never lost sight of who you are. You had struggles, but you <laughs> still kept going forward and innovating. And I think that it's so easy to get caught up when you're in a desperate situation. You stop innovating you get depressed you feel mm -hmm. like it's hopeless yeah I mean I, I think for me like you know I grew up in the Midwest my parents have been together since they were kids they're very much in love um and you know they're great parents so I always saw that and I never really knew what I wanted to do personally with my life I just kind of wanted to do this and that and everything and so I always figured well if I can just you know find a husband and get married like I'll have kids like that's what I'll do you know that's what I'll end up doing kind of and whether you know it wasn't really my thing but that's what you're supposed to do and so I think I was always kind of looking for that but I don't think I mean not knowing who I am or what I wanted to do just opened it up for the type of people that you know I did ultimately end up dating sure. and you know now I'm 45 single and like I'm fine with that <laughs> like mm -hmm. I'm great you know I I'd love to date again at some point, but probably not anytime too soon. Yeah. And I think a lot of times women are taught that they aren't whole unless they have a man yeah. in their lives. Uh, they're married and they have children. And yep. that's where they find their value rather than also seeking who they are. I think it's getting better, but I'm not sure. Uh, we still have a long way to go with mm -hmm. teaching somebody that it's okay to figure out who they are, to find out their identity. 
you know that that's so true because i've i've talked with thousands of women um worldwide and one of the common things that i find in different women is that they'll jump from relationship to relationship to relationship without taking the time to actually look at themselves and who they are and what they like and and you know fall in love with themselves yeah before falling in love for with the first guy that comes by that pays them a little bit of attention right it's like they totally forget themselves and and i tell them especially in the shelters i said i say you know you are number one not your boyfriend not your kids like you have to be whole you have to literally i know it's an old cliche you have to love yourself before you love someone else but leaving that abusive relationship take this time as a golden opportunity to look at yourself learn about who you are and how awesome you are and dwell in your qualities like um and that is going to be the healing factor so that when the next guy comes along that you're not just jumping at the the immediate you know a little bit of attention that he throws at you but that you're actually analyzing is this guy going to really um fit in with what i want with who i am you know not the other way around you know you're not falling in love with who he is but just together you know what i mean yeah well what i realized that i was doing was um you know through all my relationships i would like find this guy who is kind of like halfway there and then i do everything for him like i went and got a master's i mean that guy was great but i did go get a master's degree in music management to manage some guy's band i mean who does that right (laughs) You know, like, like, oh, I'll just change my whole direction in life to pick your life up and like make your life better, you know, and same with the next one where I was like, oh, you want to own a company? Well, guess who did all the work I I did, you know, and I've never even been in that industry, you know, so I kept seeing that happening. And I was like, wait a minute, I'm, I've like done all these jobs and all these different like careers for other people. So imagine what I could just do for myself. Sure. Exactly. You nailed it. I, and I think a lot of women do that. I mean, I think mm-hmm. in society, like we're kind of taught, like, well, you have to stand behind your man and like do all these things, you know? So, I mean, I, I took that next level, um, which I would never do again at this point. <laughs> yeah. Uh, screw, it's funny that. what age does, right? Like, screw that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, after 40, you're like, yeah, okay. You know what? Things are going to change right here. <laughs> let let uh, me, let me reanalyze. Uh, Oh I God. have a dog and I do everything for him. I mean, he looks at me funny and I'm like, do you need ice cream? Should we go, should we go to Starbucks? You know, pup cup? Like I'll do anything for him, but that that's about it. You know? Well, he's your little baby, you know? Oh and, yeah. He's the best. And he gives he you unconditional him. love. And if he bites you, you, you can say <laughs> no, you know, <laughs> no, he's, he's the best. And that, you know, that, and that actually also helped. I think that helps a lot of women when they have like, you know, a dog or a cat or something where mm-hmm. they can kind of focus on that. Cause I focused on him really hard <laughs> mm-hmm. for a while, you know, where I was just like, I think he got annoyed by me at one point. He was, I, I think he was like, please leave the house. <laughs> you know? He just wanted some alone time, but, um, but you know, he's, he's a great dog, but I think that it helps. I think, you know, how mm-hmm. animals are just so unconditional like that uh-huh. it can kind of turn things around. Those fur babies are so precious. Well, when I got divorced years ago, um, I remember my ex-husband fighting for custody of one of the cats. And (laughs) oh, yeah, I had we had two cats. And I remember my attorney saying, well, you can always buy another cat. And we're sitting out in the hallway where we're going to be meeting with the mediator. I said, excuse me. I said, you can sit in the hallway. So I went in to talk to the mediator by myself and my ex-husband was having a fit and his attorney made him sit in the hallway. So I was there with his attorney talking to the mediator. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was convincing I was the a mediator. Yes, than that to keep my dog. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I convinced the mediator that I should have custody. I said, first of all, I said, he doesn't even like, well, I'm not going to mention his name, but uh, yeah. he doesn't like my husband. I said, he pees in his shoes. And <laughs> the mediator just about lost it because I was describing how he would peed in, in my ex-husband's shoes in the summertime. And he didn't realize it until he put them on and it was in August and everybody's going, hey, oh. man, what's that smell? <laughs> Oh it was great. So anyway, he ended up paying me for about three years, like 30 bucks a month. 
which I ended up calling ADC, Aid for Dependent Cats. Oh, wow. You owe me some money, but I, I got custody. Oh, my That's God. That's amazing. Yeah, I kind of digress there, but long story short, I guess sometimes it's important to stand up and take a stance, stand up for ourselves, and it's important to have some unconditional love in our lives. It makes it so much easier. It's easier to get by, and that's what our pets can quite often do for us, like your dog has with you. And we all deserve some unconditional love. Stay tuned for more of Women Road Warriors, coming up. Kathy DeCaro is nothing short of amazing. She not only drives the world's biggest truck as a heavy equipment operator in northern Alberta, Canada. She's an international motivational speaker and the author of Dream Big, an autobiography about overcoming a lifetime of trauma and abuse that led to dreams of success. Kathy inspires people the world over to change their lives and improve their self-worth. Her book will change your life. She's passionate about personal growth and believes anyone can change their circumstances and overcome their obstacles if they believe in themselves. Her life will amaze you and seriously inspire you. Be sure to order a copy of her book, Dream Big, on Amazon.com. Industry movement Trucking Moves America Forward is telling the story of the industry. Our safety champions, the women of trucking, independent contractors, the next generation of truckers, and more. Help us promote the best of our industry. Share your story and what you love about trucking. Share images of a moment you're proud of. And join us on social media. Learn more at truckingmovesamerica.com. Welcome back to Women Road Warriors with Shelley Johnson and Kathy Takaro. We've been speaking with Jamie Beebe. She's the co-host of the true crime podcast, Strictly Stalking. We've learned that many stalkers never stop stalking, even after they get arrested and released. It's a vicious cycle, and one that's often misunderstood or dismissed by authorities. It renders the victims of this behavior terrified and vulnerable. Getting away from domestic violence is another hard thing to do with repeat offenders. Many people have difficulty leaving. Jamie, how did you make your break from your abuser? I had to plan. I planned my my escape from my ex because, you know, I didn't want to get hurt and everything. And I knew he was going to want to keep the dog. So mm -hmm. a couple months before I finally left, I registered my dog as my service animal. So there was no way that he could take the dog. Oh, when he, good when, for you. Uh, yeah. So when Word. I finally kicked him out, he's like, I'm taking the dog. I was like, well, actually I have paperwork from six months ago that says the dog is mine. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. Good thinking. Good for you. Yeah. 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 It takes a lot of planning sometimes to leave this. You had to plan for everything. It's, it's not easy. No. And it's very stressful, but yeah. you, you're a living example of what women can do. And you've been very fortuitous and, and insightful on the direction you've headed. And now you're paying it forward to help other people, which I think is tremendous. Yeah. And I, I think it's needed. And I think that most women that get out of a situation like that, they do turn around and become advocates in, you know, one form or another. I really do. Mm -hmm. So where do people find your podcast? I want you to be able to promote your podcast as well as your bikini company. This is cool. So the podcast is um, everywhere that you listen to podcasts it's called Strictly Stalking. Um, we have an Instagram at Strictly Stalking Pod. Um, and then for the bikini company, it's called The Boyfriend Bikini. And I have a website, theboyfriendbikini.com. It's also at The Boyfriend Bikini on Instagram. And you said you send a portion of your proceeds to help women. The National been... Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Yeah. The National Coalition against domestic violence. Terrific. What a wonderful cause. It's so needed. Yeah. And the, you know, it was my way to turn the negativity I was feeling at the time into something positive because, mm -hmm. you know, I, I did kind of want to, you know, shove it to him like, oh, well, look what I did. Um, which 
you know, I have no contact, so I have no idea. I'm, I'm a hundred percent sure he knows everything I do. Um, but th- that was kind of my way of like, ha ha, you know, I can help other women now. Sure. You, you've empowered yourself and now you're empowering other people. Mm-hmm. You've taken lemons and made it into lemonade. And that's probably not the best analogy. <laughs> you've, um, you've made a positive out of it. And in the yeah. guy's a jerk and you're able to take that jerk and turn it into something good for others. I like that. Thank you. Well, this has been really a lot of fun talking to you. Very, very informative, Jamie. Thank you. You too. This was great, you guys. It was awesome. I can't believe the hour just flew by. It was so good. So good. I talk a lot. (laughs) That's that's good. And these are topics that need to be discussed. Um, Stalking is definitely not something that is talked about enough. And there are a lot of people who can get seriously injured or they're living in fear for the rest of their lives. It's it's terrible. Yeah. 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 And it's so hard to get help. Mm -hmm. But you're part of the solution. This is great. Yes. Definitely trying to make a change in, in a lot of different worlds right now. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Jamie. This has been great. Thanks Thank so you much. so much. Honestly, it's been great. And, you know, if anything, uh, just talking like this, it just reignited my uh, my inner drive to, to stand up, to continue on to what I'm doing. You know, sometimes I, I get sidetracked just because it's so real. It's so, so real, you know, brought me right back to where I was and thinking, yeah, huh. if I can, if I can instill that in every woman that I meet, you know, just do yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's, you know, it's the only way to, to get, you know, things better is to bring the awareness out and talk to people. Yeah. And that's why we've got the show to empower and inspire women. And such yeah. a great show. Yeah. Thank you so much for, uh, for having me on there. Well, thank well, you, thank Jamie. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's been a pleasure and an honor. I wanted to thank everyone for listening to this great episode. And if you want to hear more episodes of Women Road Warriors or learn more about our show, be sure to check out womenroadwarriors.com. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Women Road Warriors with Shelley Johnson and Kathy Takaro. If you want to be a guest on the show or have a topic or feedback, email us at sjohnson at womenroadwarriors.com. (laughs) 